Welcome to The Manly Catholic. In this podcast, we will inspire, challenge, and equip all men to become the men they were created to be. Join us as we journey together to become the best versions of ourselves and strive to change our communities one man at a time. Hello all, welcome to another episode of The Manly Catholic. This is James, and with me, once again, Dan McNally. Daniel, how are you, sir? So good. So good. Why are you so good? Because you invited me back once more, despite all the protestations. Protestations. Of your, of your listeners. Yeah. That's a good word. Is it's that like, protests? It's like and, uh, angry objections. Is that what it is? Yeah. Protestations are angry objections. Yeah. I just thought it was another way of saying like protesting. Right. Same same root word. Oh, okay. I would say. Okay. I don't know the root word. That's fine. Probably this is the same, though. All right, we're moving on now. Let's. Uh, what are we talking together. about tonight, Dan? We are talking about something very spicy. Ooh, literal or figurative? Uh, both, actually. Oh. And we'll exp- explain what that means oh, later. I can't wait. But before we get into that, Dan, lead us in the glory be, sir. Let's do it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, Son and of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it, it was in the beginning, beginning is, is now, and ever shall, shall be, world, world without, without end. end. Amen. Amen. In the Father, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, before we dive into the topic. Uh-oh, he's trapping me. What? He was not prepared. I have a, I have a question for you. Uh-oh. Mr. Dan McNally. I'm ready. I hope. All right. I don't know what made me think of this. I was contemplating this in between patients one day. <laughs> Yesterday, to be exact. Okay. So if if the whole population was wiped out, yeah, don't need to know why. Be interesting if you did, but it would. But you don't okay, for this question. Fair. And you, you're. It's one man and one woman. Mm-hmm. Last people left that you know of. Is it morally acceptable to, we'll say, attempt to procreate even though you're not Whoa, married? Whoa, I know what he's married, really saying. Even though they're not married. Yes. It is. Yes. Why? Well, I'm no moral authority here. You're um, not. But you did teach theology, so... You I, have more and, background than and I, I have. I don't have, you know, the catechism in front of me, so I'll try to dig through the old mothball riddled brain, mm-hmm. uh, that section of it at least, mm-hmm. um, because every sacrament has a what we call matter, form, and minister, mm-hmm. which are the cons- the necessary constituent parts for a sacrament to be valid. Mm-hmm. And um, so, for example, with the Eucharist, the matter is is a particular form of bread and wine Mm -hmm. uh the form is is and with most sacraments is the prayers uh this specifically with the eucharist it's the words of of what am i trying to say initiation i'm trying to think of the word words of consecration the words of consecration Mm -hmm. right um and then the minister is the priest right Mm -hmm. but in the case of marriage um the matter is uh, I mean, it's argued uh, different the ways, the but woman. the matter is actually the man and the woman, right? It's uh-huh. the bodies that they give to one another completely. Mm-hmm. Um, and the minister is also the man and the woman. They minister the sacrament to each other. I now, we, from from the perspective of like canon law, um, we have a, an ordinary celebration of the sacrament mm-hmm. um, within this, the context of the liturgy, but... Strictly speaking, I, th- I think both out of the good of humankind and, and, and repopulating the earth, which seems to come from uh, God's command in Genesis in the very beginning, um, and from the perspective that like the, 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 the sacrament is valid without a priest or a witness of the church present, I think. Um, yeah, I think it makes perfect sense. Would it be morally permissible to not participate even though that would probably mean that wouldn't mean the end of the human species Oof, i don't know that seems like a conscience conscience thing i i, I mean i don't know who these two people are like I assuming they're both <laughs> assuming they're both like that's a good question too because then it's like if these are two people who are like let's say they're of of 
of appropriate age in terms of like mental capacity in mm-hmm. terms of like f- physical fertility and like and like readiness mm-hmm. um are they obligated even if they ha- like hate each other yeah they hate right. each other's guts and think right. the other person is disgusting looking mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that one i do not have an answer for yeah. my my inkling my catholic inkling is to s- is to lean in the direction of yeah it's probably wrong <laughs> to to not mm-hmm. repopulate the, but i don't have like a good well-formed case for that what do you think i don't know i could see both sides but then you'd explain the the sacrament of marriage and that makes sense yeah and in my in my mind because like the argument you might make is like well think of the millions of people that your decision is weighing on right like right but those people don't exist right right like in the present moment of these two people there are no actually existing human beings that are like quote unquote depending on you Mm -hmm. uh, having sex and reproducing and and repopulating the earth. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that would seem weak to me, but, but yeah, I don't, I don't know a good strong positive argument for it other than like, Hey, probably good to have some humans. Probably good to have more souls for salvation's sake. Yeah. You know, that was, that's where I was leaning to, but I didn't have any like, theological and moral base for it. The glory of God and the salvation of souls. Boom. Did I Thanks, answer Dan. to your satisfaction? Yeah, that was. You, s- you have satisfied my question. Survived another week. <sighs> I guess we'll let you back again. Well, let's dive into the topic. James, what do you know about the Shroud of Turin? What's that? So, I actually don't know too much about it. Uh, grew up, growing up Protestant. <laughs> grew up. <laughs> I grew up. <laughs> Out west in California. Tell me I'm about it. Tell about. me about it. <laughs> Mr. California. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't, I I didn't ever hear of this, if I'm being frank. I didn't hear about this. Even entering the church until probably a couple years in, and I didn't really dive into it um, until you brought it up. Was that three weeks ago now? Two weeks ago? A little while ago. And, yeah, reading about it, it's it's. I mean, I, I'm no expert on it, but it's it's very fascinating, and I'm excited to get your take on it, because I know you did a deep dive, a deeper dive than I did. Not deep enough. And I will begin by saying this episode, it should just be a taste of your experience of the Shroud of Turin, like your first steps, because there is so much to discuss. It is insane. I don't even... Uh, there is one article that maybe you can link in the show notes. It's the, sure the Father can. Spitzer article. Everybody loves, knows Father Spitzer. Spitzer. And if you don't yes. know or love him, you will as soon as you find out who he is. Um, but yeah, include that. He he wrote essentially a comprehensive, super, super thorough, super well-written, engaging article. It, it doesn't read like, like, a re- like a research paper. It re- reads like a really, really well-written article book but but it just it gives you all the information you would ever want and would not want some of it is kind of overly technical and i can't get into those parts but it just is it's very it's well it's well made so well let's let's start with what is it what is it mr mcnally what, what is, the is it Turin? well cur- let, so there is a 14 and a half by three and a half foot linen cloth with an image of an apparently crucified man uh, a faint image, photo negative image of a man with blood stains and injuries that are seemingly consistent with the injuries of Jesus' crucifixion. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is currently in Turin, Italy, in the shrine of the shrine. I don't remember exactly it's what it's It's not being called. displayed, right? Uh, is it not being displayed? Well, I sure. read that they put it away because it's so fragile and they bring it out certain times. I think that is accurate. Cannot verify. But is it is it currently being displayed right now, you think? Don't know. All right, I can look it up. Seems like the most basic of facts for me to know on an episode it's, about the Shroud. It's Turin. all good. I'll look it up. But it is currently being uh, at least housed in that shrine. Whether or not it's being on display all the time, uh, is we'll find out shortly. As of September 10th, 2024, you cannot actually see the original Shroud itself right now. Okay. The claim of those who house it there is that this is the original burial cloth of jesus christ hello everyone thank you so much for listening to that amazing episode i just want to take a quick break to thank one of our sponsors which is especially near and dear to my heart because it's all about coffee for the best coffee for a great cause we recommend mystic monk coffee 
roasted with prayer by the Carmelite monks in Wyoming, Mystic Monk Coffee has the ultimate cup waiting for you. See more at mysticmonkcoffee.com. If you decide to support the podcast on our Patreon page at the $20 per month level, we will actually send you a bag of Mystic Monk Coffee for free. As you all know, one of our missions with the podcast is to help support our priests. So what better way to do that than to combine coffee with the priesthood? Go check out their website today. Again, that's mysticmonkcoffee.com. Thank you all so much for listening. Let's get back to that episode. So the blood stains, the can image. I, can I interrupt real quick? Yeah, go Sorry. ahead. So in 2025, it actually will be displayed. Um, you want to go? I'd love to if I could. Uh, let's see. It's something while St. Pope John Paul had declared viewing for 2025, Pope Francis also authorized one. Okay, 2025 Holy Year will mark the third time the Shroud has been on public display since 2000. It does not say how long it will be displayed. But next year, which is year of Jubilee, apparently, as well. Uh, Out of Zion, oh, exhibit dates will be announced soon. Comes. Okay. Anyway. So next year it will be displayed. Continue. Excellent. Talking um, about Jesus, talking about the So blood. the claim about this thing is that it is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus Christ. So the blood on the shroud is Jesus' blood. The image is of him, um, and it has been maintained intact for 2,000 years. So. So, okay. So recapping, someone who doesn't know much about it. Sure. It's a cloth. Got that. <laughs> um, based on evidence, there's blood on it, blood stains. Mm-hmm. It appears to be. I will say it's, it's it, AB negative. Or AB positive blood. AB positive blood. Because it's the exact opposite of my blood type. And it appears that a man was buried inside of it. Um, and it appears that he was crucified based uh-huh. on what, however they can determine that from like blood stains yes. and where things are. Okay. Uh-huh. When was it discovered? Do we know that? So that is a great question. The history of this particular shroud, right, mm-hmm. uh, dates back to... I believe 1354 mm-hmm. was, the, was the was the original. <laughs> Good, I'm getting it right. Uh, <laughs> I'm he's, he's live he's fact checking. Clo- he is. I know. <laughs> oh, gosh, this is why I never want to come on. Um, 1354. There was a French soldier uh, who Ooh. brought it in uh, and basically was like, "Hey guys, I got this shroud for you. It's uh, it's the shroud that Jesus was buried in." I think the implication is. I don't know. He was like a crusader who some somehow mm. came uh, into possession of it. Okay. I, I never really found anything specific about this guy. Okay. To be fair, I didn't look really into him that much. It's all good. Um, so 1354 is when it first shows up in, I guess, what we would say is commonly agreed upon historical data. Mm-hmm. Um, some people will say that there's accounts of it in Constantinople in like t- around 1200. Mm-hmm. But then when it was sacked, it sort of disappeared. So okay. you maybe make the argument it goes back to twelve hundred ish, um, but that's not two thousand years. That's uh, at the very best, that's eight hundred years ish, right? And probably six hundred and fifty or seven hundred. Um, and then it was housed there for I want to say like a hundred years because it was about the mid fourteen hundreds that it was moved to a different city in France. Uh, and then a hundred years after that, or so, fifteen thirty-two, it was damaged in a fire. Mm. So there was it was super super hot, and there was literal melted metal kind of fell onto the case that it was being housed in, and it burned. Oh, wow. Right, so burned pieces of the shroud. You can actually, if you look at the picture of the shroud, you can see there's kind of folded over. There's these kind of repeated triangular shapes, um, which show you. Uh, where the burns were and where patches were put in by religious sisters at the time to try to repair uh, the shroud uh, back to as best they could, you know, at the time. And uh, so after that, in 1578, it was moved to Turin, where it is today Mm -hmm. uh, in the in the chapel of the Holy Shroud. Mm -hmm. Another important date that we want to know, skip ahead to the 20th century. In 1978, there was a huge battery of tests, uh, investigations that were run on the the shroud by STIRP. That is the acronym for the Shroud of Turin 
uh, research project. So that was in 1978. We'll probably reference that a lot, and you can read about those. About 10 years later, there was the famous radiocarbon dating. Um, so I don't remember actually who, who did, which lab did the radiocarbon dating. But um, famously, a test was run uh, that resulted in this time frame of somewhere in the 1200s to somewhere in the 1300s. I want to say it was like 1270 to 1390 was the time oh, range that job. the carbon dating gave yeah. them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, of course, you look at that carbon dating and you say, oh, well, it's forgery. When did, we, when did we see it appear in history? Right. Right about that time when mm -hmm. this French guy showed up and said, hey, this is the uh, imperial cloth of Christ, wink, wink. <laughs> um, nice evil laugh. I think he snickered just like just that. Just a little bit. Um, so that was 1988 was this famous radiocarbon dating test. Okay. And then a couple of less important dates between then and now. I mean, there was another fire that it was in, but it wasn't, to my understanding, it wasn't damaged by that fire. Uh, Were these fires accidental do we know the cause or did someone like try to there's no no one that i read indicated that there was any foul play like intended. arson or anything yeah, okay just correct. curious mm. um so yeah okay question so far you following i'm following okay so carbon dating that was done that was 78 and it indicated the fibers that they tested were from Around when that mm -hmm. knight discovered it and brought it forth. So, so 1290 to 1370 or whatever. So you case closed. The Shroud of Trin is a medieval forgery. And that is all you need to know. Okay. All right. Well, so good episode. That, but wait, there's more. But wait, I'm, I'm not telling the whole story. All okay. right. So James, okay. so far. Yeah. What are your thoughts in terms of the details of the story? I would like to know more about this French guy, but you know. There's not much to be said about. Okay. That's what's fine. his name. Geoffrey okay. de Charny. Okay, so I hope did, I said that right. So the carbon dating test was done in 78. So but before this carbon dating test was done. But yeah. Because the, the STERP investigations and oh, research was in, in, was in okay. 78, right? Okay, yeah. so they did the testing in 88. Okay, so but before this testing, everyone presumed this was the authentic shroud. Was there much doubt about? So did the carbon dating testing basically introduce all this a lot of doubt, negativity right? and doubt? Uh -huh. And they're like, oh, this is a forgery. The Catholic Church made it up, basically. I think so. Okay. I think that's a good way to put it. I okay. So then what, what happened after the testing done was done? I'm guessing more people investigated it at this point. Um, a little bit, yeah, here and there. So there are a number of other tests that have been done since then um, by various researchers, some associated with STERP, some not. Um, I want to, I can't remember all the names right now, but I do have them in the notes here. Julia Fonti. So there's four different tests that have been done since then. One can I, can I ask you a question real quick? Yeah. Without going into too specific of testing on the carbon dating test. Mm -hmm. So b basically when you do a test, like you just take a small fragment of it, right? Right. So... Four small strips were taken from the shroud. Okay, but this is a large cloth. Correct. Okay. So ideally, you'd want to take like different fragments from different parts of the shroud mm -hmm. and then compare the results, right? Right. Plus, there were fires which could have tainted the sampling. Okay, so that's what I was getting at when I was saying. Sorry. What are your, What questions might you... Shoot. What might okay. be... Uh, what details oh, so might I'm on, be I'm on track. Okay. You are. So, I, I mean, because carbon dating testing... I mean, it's. I don't really know good. all the science about. Okay, so it is yeah. good. Okay, all right. I don't know the the efficacy behind. I hate it to use that. the word gold standard because we were trained in PT school with very specific use of very specific terms. But um, I so want to say it's, it's the gold standard of testing. I want to say ancient that. things. I can't, I can't basically. tell you that for okay, sure. That's fair. I'm we're gonna, no colloquially. I'm going to say it's gold standard. Okay, that sounds good. Sure. Okay, so then did someone do new carbon dating testing with different so fibers? So there's no. And I, this is the thing that was my question is how difficult is it to approve a new carbon dating test? Because that's what right. everybody, I mean, that's what Father Spitzer calls for. Like his whole paper, the purpose of his paper is to justify his final statement, which is let us have another piece so in and another crack at it. 40 years, no one has, no done, one has done another carbon dating test, right? Now... Seems a little weird. It does seem a little weird, and and Maybe it kind of so gets fragile. into the it gets into the realm of 
why is the why is the shroud important? So we'll come back to the research here in a minute. That's fair. But we think about like what is the shroud to you? So when I was in college, I did a study abroad semester, spring of 2011, and I went to France, mm-hmm. and I happened to just be at Notre Dame uh, in Paris at 3 p.m. on a Friday during Lent. That was not planned in any way, shape, or form. I just happened to be there. I mean, going to France was, and going to Notre Dame was. But the timing was totally unplanned. And I'm we're like wandering over to the church, and they're like, something is starting. And we're like, oh, what's going on? Are they doing mass or something? And they're like, oh, no, they're bringing out the crown of thorns for veneration. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? I didn't even know the crown of thorns still existed. Much less did I know that it was housed at Notre Dame. In Paris, and I was like, "Okay, well, can we go?" <laughs> and they were like, "Sure, come Why on not? in." And yeah, there's this long procession. You go up, and there's this little spot at the front by the altar where you just they bring out the crown of thorns. You give it a little kiss, venerate, pray before it, and head back to your seat. Similarly, in Rome, right in the history of the Catholic Church, we have a lot of relics of saints. Mm-hmm. Um, bones of saints Mm -hmm. first second third class relics so parts parts of the body or something that they used regularly or something that touched them or Mm -hmm. something that touched something that touched them are the three classes um but is it really the crown of thorns i i I don't have a ton of reasons to say no Mm -hmm. i don't have a ton of reasons to say yes i mean i have it on the authority of the people at the church there which is Mm -hmm. not much Mm -hmm. but I mean, there's something to be said for why are they saying this? Like, what do they have to gain or lose by... It's not like they're gaining fortune and fame by... But anyway, I mean, I hadn't heard about it until I was literally standing outside of the church and they had to tell me. (laughs) I was like, oh, this is amazing. Um, But anyway, but I think the whole... The the, the beauty of it is is it called to mind the actual crown of thorns and the passion of our Lord. And Mm -hmm. so that was the beauty of it. Did I need that to be the crown of thorns? Not necessarily. Is it possible or probable that it is? Maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, this is not an episode on the Crown of Thorns, but that kind of comes back to the Shroud of Turin. And the reason I sort of di- diverged onto that topic is I don't know if there, if the, the idea is that we're trying to preserve it, preserve the sanctity of it, of like, oh, we don't want to do another carbon dating test because what if it confirms our worst fears that it's not real? Well, that doesn't change our faith at all. Right. Right? Like the fact that that Shroud isn't the real Shroud doesn't mean that there, there wasn't a shroud, right. right? That Jesus didn't exist and rise from the dead. However, I think there is a ton of evidence to suggest that it actually is, which is the cool part. Well, I think it goes into like, I mean, another topic for another day is even just marrying apparitions like Our Lady of Fatima, Lords, mm-hmm. all these. Like, do you have to believe in them? No. Right. The church has very clear about that. You're not required to. It's not a, a dogma of the faith. But it strengthens your faith for sure. And, you know, I think, too, just being reasonable and logical creatures that God made us, you can look at these things with look at the evidence Mm -hmm. and you can make your own conclusions. Right. But again, like you said, we have to keep these in mind. This doesn't make or break our faith. Right. Right. Did Our Lady of Fatima actually happen? You know, if you looked at the evidence, you said, no, it didn't. That shouldn't change the fact that you should still be Catholic. Right. It shouldn't change your faith at all. We still believe in the Trinity, that Jesus came. He was born of a virgin and he died and he rose again like that. These things don't change that now. But I think you told me this too, either yesterday or the day before too, but it's also like a little nugget in your back pocket mm-hmm. where it's like, Oh, that's cool. It's like, Oh yeah. Like when like I'm struggling this, in my faith, it's like, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's actually good reasons. And there's a lot right. of like, the Lord has left us some, some reminders and some, some question marks. He, he hides himself so that those who are seeking him, can find him, but mm-hmm. those who aren't looking uh, might not necessarily, right? So if you're if you're blinding yourself to it, you can hide from him. He's not going to make it impossible, and he's not going to force you to do anything. But I was, it's almost like a romance. Like, it's almost like a wooing kind of a thing. Hey, all, thank you so much for listening to that episode. I just want to take a quick break to tell you about one of our sponsors, which is Tan Books. Tan Books is a family-owned traditional Catholic publishing company whose mission is to help people become saints. They believe that it is their duty to preserve and promote the spiritual, theological, and liturgical traditions of Holy Mother Church, especially in these challenging times. 
At TAN, they offer a wide variety of resources to help individuals on their journey to holiness and to become a saint. With over 1,000 titles ranging on topics from theology, scripture, church history, and books designated specifically for men, TAN aims to provide valuable knowledge and guidance that can help strengthen your faith and inspire spiritual growth. Join Father Dom and myself on this journey to sainthood. Visit tanbooks.com and be sure to use the code Manly Catholic at checkout to get 15% off your order and also helps support the podcast as well. Together, let's strive to become saints, aligning our lives with the teachings of the church and fulfilling our mission to bring Christ to the world. Again, that is code Manly Catholic at tanbooks.com. Thank you all so much for listening to this. Let's get back to that episode. It, I, I was actually listening to uh, Matt Frad interviewing Peter Kraft this oh, wow. from like two weeks ago. And he's been on the show a few times. I right. love Peter Kraft. He's he's an awesome. awesome man. But they they said a quote similar to that, and I think Matt Frad said it. And um, I don't know who. Well, he they're both such poets to. anyway. Yeah, they yeah. really are. But he said, "God gives us enough light that if you seek Him, you can find Him. But also, if you want to turn away from the light, you can." Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing. And so it's like these little flashes of light, if you will. That was a great transition. Did you intend to do that? No way. <laughs> why? Why? Well, s- why say you, Mr. McNally? Well, I'd, I'd, there just might be some flashes of light up ahead Ooh. in our future. Ooh, like headlights? Like um, ultraviolet radi- radiation bursts. Tell me about the bursts. Well, maybe I'll get to that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> So I think those who, who want to hold to the idea that the shroud is a is a is a hoax or is a medieval fraud will will point to the carbon dating and say hey this is a gold standard why it's we we've put this thing to rest it's it's a fraud why are we even talking about this and why haven't you done another test if if you're so confident that this is the thing are there other i mean other arguments against it arguments against the, against the, the 1988 besides, test no besides the carbon dating um, or is that like, oh, the carbon dating said it's not. The, the only other, sh- the only other argument I, I don't think would be represented as a as a discrete argument, more so as like an attitude or an animus of like, the dark ages were fraught with, with forgeries and fakes, and like this, sensationalism. This, and- yeah, there's that quote that's something like, if you took all the quote unquote shards of the true cross, you could like build oh. a church with it or something, yeah, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, there's there, and, and an attitude of skepticism is not something that I'm ever going to poo poo because I think scripture actually calls us to be skeptics a right. little bit. Like it calls mm-hmm. us to, you know, test everything, hold fast to what is good and mm-hmm. reject what is evil. Um, so I think a general skepticism about the ability to maintain things throughout history with 2000 years, a lot of people think that history is a really foggy game of telephone and I mm-hmm. can't hold that against them. I think I, that's, yeah. Yeah. In in emotion, it's I feel like that's more of kind of an emotional, kind of intuitive argument rather than any sort of evidence. But I get it. I feel how that has power. Um. And, and then I don't know. The, maybe another motivation might be. I, I'm sure there's lots of good arguments that I'm not thinking of. But another motivation might be like if you don't believe uh, in Christianity or you don't believe in the divinity of Christ, uh, then you kind of have to hold to the idea that this isn't real, right? right? Because no, if it's real, true. what are the implications of that? Yeah, that's a good point. It's crazy implications right. if it's if it's real. Yeah. Um, okay. So there are another there are a number of tests that have been performed since then. Four specifically that I can think of. One is a vanillin test, which was done. I want to say in the early two thousands by one of the Sterp researchers, mm-hmm. um, and basically it just. It, it it tests how cellulose breaks down over time. That's all you okay. need to know. If I say okay. anything more, you're gonna fall asleep. That's fine. Um, spec. I, th- I want to say one was spectroscopy. Uh, so spectroscopic analysis. Yeah, there were two of those tests, and then one was a fiber compressibility test. So I guess mm-hmm. again, I'm no I'm no linen fiber expert, but supposedly there is a test that you can perform on samples from the shroud that you can kind of get a determination based on the material of how, of what its age is based on how it reacts to certain mechanical movements. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, three other pieces of evidence are given in father Spitzer's paper. Um, one is pollen that pollen that is found on the shroud, uh, that is indigenous to 
Judea 2,000 years ago, the season, like springtime. Um, One is the Roman coins that seem visible on the eyes Mm. of the man in the image. Uh, is that how they bury them with the yeah. Roman coins? Yeah. So the I, crazy actually, thing I don't is, think I knew that. Like up close analysis, if you look at the coins, um, there are arguments. And again, I'm not going to give you the full arguments, but this is just a kind of a, an appetizer to go look it up for yourself. The idea is that like so the, the coins that appear in the image based on the lettering, based on the, sh- the like the shapes and things that they find on it, appear to be a rare... Like this is, I'm going to tell you this and you're going to think that I'm like, this sounds crazy because it's, it's such cr- insane evidence, but like the, the, in, the coins that are on, uh, allegedly in this image, according to the, the, the people who know more than I do, um, were a kind of a, I guess a rare coin that was minted by Pontius Pilate really like during his reign and yeah. only him. Right. Correct. And there were like 40 of them in, in, that are known to be in existence right now. Right. So that's another one. And then the third item is these 120 coincidences with the Sudarium of Orvieto, which Sudarium is just Latin for handkerchief. It's also called the Sudarium Christi. So in the gospels, they talk like you, you see the apostles run to the tomb and there's the burial cloth, but then there's like the head piece or the head cloth that's like put off to the side. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, there's actually kind of a cool story about how like Jewish rabbis, I don't know if this is apocryphal or if this is legit, but like Jewish rabbis would 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 put aside a certain cloth, meaning that like they're they're going to return. So mm-hmm. I don't know, a little, little fun Jewish cultural uh, bit there. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Sudarium, Sudarium of Orvieto is a kind of a much smaller cloth, like a cloth that you could put over somebody's face or over their head um, that has historical traceability to about the 600s AD. And it has blood stains, markings, indications of um, like, like even like lung fluids that would have, that would have maybe come out of this, uh, this man's nose after perhaps uh, like like pleural effusion after lungs were collapsed or, mm-hmm. or pierced or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the shroud of Turin and the Sudarium of Orvieto, it's if you if you overlay them together, there are 120 distinct like blood stains and like wound markings and and like shades and just i again i don't know all the terms that you'd use but 120 different individual coincidences where they line up exactly perfectly hmm. which is kind of crazy and also really interesting for the uh for the dating as well right if the if the sudarium goes at least back to the 600s if not earlier then certainly with the coincidence with the shroud there's kind of a connection there um w- the craziest thing i would say is there is a photo negative image on the shroud. So it's an image of this crucified man that is just on the very, very, very most superficial top layer of the shroud that, as it's described in the research, is not blood, it's not dyes, it's not chemicals. It is literally just the only thing that could produce it is like photo like photonic I don't, I don't know the right words but like photo radiation hmm. right radiation super 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 bright light over a tiny 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 period of time so like like a millionth of a second yeah. or less or something like that that didn't produce any heat right because if it was like a radiation burst because there was like tectonic shifts or something or there was an earthquake because remember when christ was crucified there was an earthquake yeah, right. so maybe the tectonic shifts are or plates are shifting and and so there's something that was some kind of radiation was really but like it also wasn't there was no heat energy release because that would scorch mm-hmm. the shroud wow, as well right. and it's in the perfect three-dimensional image of this man mm. implying that on both sides of the shroud there is this photo negative image that could only be produced by an impossibly powerful burst of light that didn't produce heat that created a 3d image that as it was created, the shroud would have had to cave in on itself while the light was exp- like bursting forth from it. Hmm. Can you th- 
Can you think of anything that that, that might sound like? <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> so I know that sounds like crazy towns. Um, Father Spitzer articulates it a lot better than I just did, but mm-hmm. I articulated it, I think, in an excited fashion. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing that that's the one detail to me that's crazy. Like of and all it's the hard to prove that it's a forgery. There's all the uh, these other details exactly right. Mm-hmm. Like the vanilla testing, the spectroscopy, the compressibility tests, the pollen testing, the coins, the coincidences with the Sudarium of Orvieto, the just. The typing of the blood, which is consistent with all the Eucharistic miracles, which are the same blood type as Christ, which is, has commonly been said is AB positive, all these different things. But that light, the, the, the photo radiation burst negative image. It's hard to dispute. How does, how does a medieval forger do that? When right. we can't even do that, right? Didn't right. you say that I think we, we don't have the I think technology? I we have the technology or? to do it in like very small... Um, not like, n- but not in the face of a man, not in a 3d image of a crucified man. Yeah. 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 Um, that's interesting. The thing that's interesting about the carbon dating test as well is there's a lot of speculation that the samples were not produced in a, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, meaning manner. I don't want to ascribe negative intentions to the testers, but we'll just say that it's it's taken a lot of criticism mm-hmm. that a lot of the the sampling might not have been done as scientifically as it needed to be done, right? There are many pieces of the shroud that were burned. Burned that were repaired. There are multiple, you know, pieces of cloth throughout history. And again, if you think about it, if it was burned in the 1500s and it was and it was replaced Sorry. Yeah. Burned in the 1500s, replaced in the 1500s. It might be replaced with fibers from the 1500s from around that time or from before. Right. Because, again, right. the testing said the carbon test dating puts it between like 12 and 1400 ish. Right. So I don't know how long medieval folk kept linen cloth around. Probably a long time. But again, it was at least before if, if the carbon dating is, is right. There's I don't think it's unreasonable to say, oh, they had linen that they that was from prior to, you know, prior era that th- that was just i don't i don't know how medieval i'm not a mil- medieval linen expert till today um but again the point is it's the suspicion around the scientific nature of the testing the level of evidence there how well the samples were treated and and honestly it's a drama that plays out when you read this cuz you you start to question well what are the intentions of the scientists who want to disprove it and what are the intentions of the scientists that prove it because you could make you could make both arguments right Right. you could say the ones that did the dating test they're just atheists scientists or whatever and then you know on the other side you could say well all the people in the stirp investigations they're just credulous christians and they're just they're just assuming their conclusion from the beginning and so i don't think this podcast episode is where we're going to get all the total answers to it Mm -hmm. it's dive into it because it is a it's actually really a kind of a thrilling drama to read all the different research from both sides. But I think like ultimately for me, I think the biggest reason a lot of people don't is the doubts about medieval forgeries and the 1988 carbon test. But the reason why you should give it more credit maybe than a lot of people want to give it is all of the things we talked about, but specifically the image on it. Um, I mean, it, take your pick because there were a ton of, a ton of different things that that are just mind-boggling even down to the Pontius Pilate minted coins. coins like that's crazy um but let those let those be the seeds of i guess your own investigation well i, and I think deeper. too that that's kind of the overarching theme of, of why we want to do something like this because you know there are so many amazing things out there and i think whether this is true or not, I mean, it appears that it is just reading this. But I feel like God gives us little nuggets like this throughout exactly the centuries. And like we talked about, too, it God knows we're curious creatures. And something like this, it, mm-hmm. it makes that curiosity, puts it to good use. I like to but, I like to call them Joshua stones. Because you remember the story of Joshua when they, oh, after Moses dies and yes. they cross the river. And what does God command them to do? But he says, go and grab, I think, 12 stones. I'm not sure exactly how many, but he says, go grab stones from the riverbed and like pile them up on the side of the river mm-hmm. so that you remember 
when right. I stopped the flow of the Jordan River. Right, yeah. And these are the stones that mm-hmm. came from the bed of that river. And I think this is just another, like these are the little Joshua stones that God kind of scatters along our path. It's like, well, oh, whoa. You know? What I think too that you said as well is like whatever the motivation of the scientists too, because we all have biases and that's impossible to totally knock out of our psyche. Right. And, but like you said too, if, if this is true and there are atheists working on it, I mean, this can totally uproot <coughs> their whole belief system. Right. And I know Trent Horn talks about this too, because Trent Horn does a lot of debates. Right. And I forgot who it was or what he was debating exactly, but um, he says, you need to be so sure you need to be so grounded in, in your faith and your belief system, but you also need to know what would make you turn away from it. Yeah, exactly. And I, so his biggest point was because he, he basically was putting forth his, these, I think it was about miracles. He's putting forth his evidence for miracles. He eventually just asked the guy, what body of evidence do you need to verify that a miracle took place? Right. And the guy gave like a cop out answer. He's like, well, you know, like, well, God would know what kind of evidence I would need in order for me to believe him and stuff like that. It's like, no, you can't, you can't have an honest argument with me if you don't even know what would convince you. Right. And he said, if you can convince me that Jesus did not die and rise right. from the dead, I would stop being Catholic there's, right now. There's that famous quote that says, if the bones of Jesus were discovered tomorrow, Christianity would remain unchanged. And it's like, that's so, I mean, maybe some institutions of Christianity that, that, that either one, frauds who claim to be Christian who are making money off of it mm-hmm. or two hospitals and schools that despite the fact that maybe like all of the religion was disproved, mm-hmm. there's still a movement in their heart right. that they need to, they still need to do these good things that they've already started. Mm-hmm. But the, the, at the heart of that statement is just that deep cynicism that Christians don't care about the truth. Right. When in reality, Trent Horn is saying what's, what's most true. Yeah. If those bones were discovered and we can verify that those are Jesus's mm-hmm. bones, then yes, we're done. Yeah. Like, what are we doing here? There's then? no, why are, why are we doing this? Yeah. Yeah. This, this podcast is pointless. Find a new topic for the podcast. <laughs> Hardcore atheism. Would you still want to do that with me? Hardcore atheism? Yeah, the hardcore. I have good the manly the manly atheist, atheist, atheist podcast. Atheist <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Different spin on it. But no, this is fascinating. I mean, I I really do encourage you guys. It's it's 33 page document, but I'm mean, Father Spitzer like Dan said, if you don't know about him, he is so smart he is um but he does things in in a very um well, look down to foot, earth way footnotes. so like his the way he writes it in the main paper is very approachable but if you look at the bottom of each page like his footnotes are, are just vast yeah There's, i know it's, it's so well researched yeah he has uh i mean he's have at least 60 that i see 64 yeah so clearly he's he's done his research and Again, like Dan said as well, he he makes it very easy to read and digest. It's not like a like a um, a scientific paper where you don't know half the words and you have to look everything up. So he right. does a good job on on explaining that. And yeah, with regard to the intentions of the researchers too, I wanna I want to assume an, like an impartial uh, desire for truth on both sides mm-hmm. as as I read through. I don't want to just assume oh well they're atheists so or they're Catholic so. Um, but it it comes down to like Occam's razor. It's not like there's a lot of options here. It's like either it is or it isn't. Mm-hmm. There's not like a third option where it sort of is. Right. It is or it isn't. You said earliest historical record was 616 AD. What That's was for that the one? Sudarium. Oh, that was the Sudarium. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and the, the pollen stuff too. I mean, I'm just fascinated that we have all these tests that can actually do this kind of mm-hmm like dating it's like oh yeah this is from uh this particular plant that was known to be in that region at that time and you know it just it's stuff that we can do with with scientific like yeah and tests and studies it's pretty even, fascinating like a fascinating little detail just out of father spitzer's paper um because one of the things they said is they found paint on the cloth mm-hmm. and that was presented as evidence that it was a forgery mm-hmm. except li- like listen to this piece of like this is just the, an intelligent well-researched person mm-hmm. just saying truths listen to this there are some microscopic particles of paint on the cloth unrelated to the image but these are explained by a medieval custom called sanctification of paintings in which an artist would paint a copy of the shroud and then touch the painting to the shroud to sanctify it 
The contact led to a transfer of some microscopic particles of paint onto the shroud, which moved around it when the shroud was folded and rolled. So it's like none of you have ever heard of sanctification of paintings yeah. because you're not medieval art experts and I'm not a medieval art expert. But if you read a research paper from a scientist who said, yep, there's paint on it, well, then it's done. Like we automatically just go, oh, yep, I guess it's a fraud. Yeah. But then three sentences with like, that's such a ring of truth. Right. That's a person talking about something they know about yeah. and be like, oh, wow. Yeah. So like humble thyself in the sight well, of the Lord. You know what I mean? Like no, but it, we all want to think we're right. And it's there's so much more that we don't even know. Well, we don't just know. don't take things at face value, too. I mean, it's St. Paul always says question everything. Right. Don't believe everything you hear on the Internet. <laughs> but like like the carbon dating, too, again, at podcasts. face value. Except for this one, you should yeah. take everything. Take everything from this podcast at face value. But everything else is terrible and question that. Good call. But even the carbon dating, if you th- if you take that at face value, you would be like, oh, well, that definitely disproves it. But it's like, right. no, where do they get the fibers? No. Well, yeah, it's like what? I always, whenever somebody fe- like seems like they have a slam dunk on something that is seems inherently controversial, mm-hmm. I always want to hear what the other side is going to say, right. whether that's a political argument or religious argument. Right. And whether it's going to disprove what I think. Because I, I don't know. I want to learn. I don't like being wrong, but I don't like being wrong and then insisting on that as being right either. Right. It, it, it's, it it's hurts about, less to be wrong and change your mind than it does to be wrong and stay wrong. Well, it's about pursuing the truth, right? Right. And always making sure that you have... I mean, that's the ultimate goal. Which is that something that manly Catholics want to do. Wow. Oh! Well done. What a... He oh. just brought it full circle. Man, is there anything else you want to say about the shroud um, before we wrap it up? Yes, but there's too much to say. Read, read the paper. It's 33 pages. Yeah, in the age of TikToks and YouTube Shorts, that might feel long, but like it's like the shortest book you've ever read. Ooh, it's like the shortest book. Think of it that way. I like that. And you'll come out so much better for it and happier, probably. So that's my challenge for you. Ooh, read good challenge. The Easy challenge. Page paper. Easy challenge. Dive into it. Digest it. Question it. And send us some comments if you... Yeah. Like, comment, subscribe. Disagree (laughs) everything with everything that we just said today. I would love that. I would love to be disagreed with. Then we talk about it on the podcast. Let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) Till next time, everyone. Go out there and be a saint. Thank you all so much for tuning in to another episode of The Manly Catholic. If you have not already done so, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. It will also help grow the show and reach as many men as possible. We truly think this podcast can change families and help men to change the world. Thank you again so much for tuning in and God bless you.